All right, so I'm gonna show you guys how to achieve the proper bolt stretch for your connecting rods. I went ahead and did um, cylinders one through seven, and I kept number eight to show you guys as an example of what I did to complete the rest of them. So depending on, and this is gonna be specific to your connecting rod style that you guys purchase. So what I'm using for this right here is not gonna be used for every single connecting rod on the aftermarket. This is for a CP Carrillo I-beam connecting rod with a steel bolt. Now, CP Carrillo puts their part numbers for their bolts right on there. So that's gonna be important in case if you guys either lost the brochure or it never came with one and you guys need to figure out what bolt stretch to achieve. So this is CP Carrillo's website right here. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna come up here to the top where it says support we're gonna to go to installation sheets and then scroll right over to steel bolt instructions. Something like this is what should have came with the actual um, connecting rods, which they did. I just happened to left it at the house. Um, so I went here to reference it. So this bottom part of the brochure right here is what we're looking for. The bolt that I have is a 3 8 by 24 it is a WMC style with an H6 head marking. So that is going to be this specification right here. I'll highlight it and then zoom in for you guys. So right here. So what we start out with, if you look at the fourth column, it says 10 to 18 foot pounds of pre-torque. So we will torque it down to 10 foot pounds, then move to 18 and then we will add 70 degrees of angle. Um, I've already tested this on a connecting rod vise and I found that 69 degrees um, gets me right in my specification, which is 0.65 or six and a half thousandths to seven and a half thousandths of bolt stretch, which you guys can see in this column right here. That's what we're trying to achieve. Now, this, this final torque imperial value is where you should lie as a final torque after the bolt has achieved this amount of stretch. So if you're using, um, let me see if I have it around here. Nah, it must be, must be on the shop. But anyways, if you're using a snap-on style uh, torque wrench, it will actually give you your final torque value after you've used torque angle, which is kind of neat. And you can just reference that number to this column right here, the final torque value. So I'm going to try to do this with, with one hand, and I will show you. So initially, if you guys watch the other videos and you're at this step right here, I told you that you guys would just put all the connecting rod um, caps on by hand and then go back and torque them. And that's exactly what I did. So you're going to see right here just a little bit of pressure is going to break this one free. So broke that free. And we're going to take one of these out just to show you an example here. Now, this is probably the most important um, thing that I want to stress to you guys right here. ARP does not have this problem. So if you're running ARP 2000 hardware, I highly doubt you'll run into this issue, which is why I almost didn't catch it for this one. But if you're running an I-Beam CP Carrillo rod like I am, the hardware that they attach with the rods are not the same length. They are all like very different. And that's gonna be extremely important when you're using this rod stretch tool device because you will come in here and I'll try to do this with one hand. Forgive the camera. All right. So you'll put this bolt on right here, right? And you can see that, and then you'll zero your gauge. And then you'll think your gauge is zero to this, but then you'll throw another bolt in here and this thing could jump all the way here or here. And then you're torquing it down the same as the other hardware and then you're checking the values when you're expecting to be between six and a half, which is right here, and seven and a half, which is right here. If you don't fall somewhere on those values and you're like way over here or way under here, it's probably because you didn't zero out the bolt. 
So what I did to save some time is I mixed all of the bolts. So I put the two closest bolts as a pair. Um, so that way the dial wouldn't move that crazy on me. So I'll zero this bolt out again, just like that. So once your thing is zero, then you can take your bolt back out. Thread it in by hand, all the way down till it seats. And then you'll take the second one out and you'll do the same thing. So you'll bring the second bolt out, you'll verify that you're either on your zero or extremely close to it. And then you'll bring it back over, insert it into the other side of the rod. And then what you're gonna do is torque to 10 foot pounds first, each side, then 18 foot pounds, and then Depending on what you experience at your connecting rod vise, um, you can do the recommended 70 degree angle, but normally when you're doing, when you're torquing something, you go past your value. So that's why I did 69 and it happened to get me really close and I get about seven thousandths right in the middle of bolt stretch. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna torque these in sequence and then we'll be back. All right, so we just got this all torqued up, check the bolt stretch. And I'll show you guys on here what it should look like, a minimum of six and a half thousandths, which is exactly what I think I got on this guy. So right there, move it around a little bit, eh, just under, oh, about it, it's about six and a half, just under. So this other side was right at seven. So about seven, seven, two-ish. Just means that we probably went like half, half of a degree tighter on this side than we did this one. And that's literally that difference of half of a thousandths. All right, so we have our entire rotating assembly finished at this point. We have all the rods in, they're all torqued. All of our main caps are torqued. All the pistons are in, all of the rings are oriented correctly. The short block is almost done. The last couple steps that you guys have to do is install plugs, oil pump, and for the purposes of this being on the engine stand, we're not gonna put on the rear main um, housing plate nor the actual oil pan. So we're gonna leave those components off, but technically if you wanted a completely done short block, you would throw those items on. But that's really only if you're completing the entire long block. So if you guys have a little crankshaft turning tool, you want to release your actual um, set screw in here. And then this drone should just slide right off. We'll set that right there. And then we'll get ready to install the oil pump. I'll get this thing turned up right and we'll get the oil pump set up and then We'll show you guys how to put it on. All right, so it's time to put on the oil pump now. So you have a couple different options here. You guys can get a completely built oil pump like I did, or you guys can use a factory one. Either or are gonna have the same exact installation procedures. Um, just to kind of show you guys, Ford has a little bit of a weird design when it comes to their oil pump. So this is very important that you guys follow this step by step. I have access to um, a database called All Data through Ferris. So I'm gonna use that as a reference to install the oil pump here. And I'm gonna open up and zoom in this picture real quick here to show you guys. So this is the orientation of the oil pump, all right? We come over here and the snout position is not crucial, crucial. Um, they have it at nine o'clock in the picture, but really, this is only important to these little flat spots on the crank right here, right? You just kind of got to know that the snout is in the middle of those two flat spots. 
So if you look at the picture here, we have four hardware. Now it kind of looks like one and three are different sizes, but they're the same exact size bolt. Two and four are completely different. So one and three are the same. Position two is gonna be the one that looks just like a stud and the actual nut is like halfway down. And then bolt four is gonna have a nine millimeter hex head on the top and that's going to go in this position so this is how the hardware should look as it's installed onto the block now you'll notice your oil pump will have these little notches these little flat spots on both sides of your inner rotor gear right here need to line up with the flat spots on this guy so I'm gonna go ahead and clean this up. Now, if you guys need to actually assemble this and you guys have yours apart, again, it's, it's, it's really easy. There's really nothing to it. You guys just need to buy, um, let me see if I have it over here. Yes, I do. So for the back plate, now these happen to be different hardware than what OEM would be but the same style um, Torx bit. It's not a standard Torx. It's like a weird variant of it, and it's a specialty tool that you guys gotta buy to be able to remove the hardware on the back. Then it's as simple as adding a little bit of assembly lube, um, installing your rotors with the actual um, name, or if there's any routing facing towards you, facing towards the back plate. And then you verify some clearances like your oil um, pump gears to housing clearance, your tip clearances, but you kind of have to have an idea of what you're looking for when you're taking this completely apart. So if you're buying it or putting in a new one, nine times out of 10, this thing's gonna be already together for you guys. You'll notice something on the back here that is a little bit of an O-ring. That's not used on a standard oil pump. So don't think that if you're using a standard one, you need this piece. This is just an added um, O-ring to this billet back plate right here. That is a very nice piece with some Martin Ware heat treated oil pump gears, billet oil pump gears. And they also have vein ports designed into them. Boundary did an excellent job. They made the inlet port a little larger. You can see um, sealant that was completely used all the way around and it's that press fit sealant. Kind of like something like Maybe something like a retaining compound or something that's an absence of air because their their back plate is that flat. So very nice piece. I'm really looking forward to this thing, um, giving the engine some really nice oil pressure throughout its life. Very expensive. This thing was nine hundred dollars, um, as you see it. So it's not cheap by any means whatsoever. But I showed you that. Now let's go here to the actual torque specifications because this is what's gonna be important for you guys. So right here, and I'll go ahead and pause it, screenshot this, do whatever you need, but after you hand tighten down the bolts, stage two tells you where the weirdness begins with Ford. You gotta tighten the first bolt completely different from the second bolt, completely different from the third and fourth and yada, yada, yada. And then you gotta add some crazy degrees to this hardware and steps um, in stage three. So this is the torque sequence that you guys have to follow to install the oil pump. You follow this and you guys will be all right. So I'm gonna go ahead and knock that out and then we'll move on to the next step of the block, guys. All right, so we got the oil pump on. It's all torqued up. Um, I marked it because it's all torqued and stuff, but once you guys get the pump installed, the next step is, well, you guys can pretty much say that you're completely done with the short block, so to speak. If um, you want to sit here and add, you know, an oil pan, oil pickup tube, that's really it. And the rear um, main housing. I'm going to show you guys all of that when I get ready to install the rest of the block. But just for now, because it's on the engine stand, um, that's going to be one of the last things I do. So the next step from this point right here is to actually build the cylinder head. Now I have one built right now. Show you guys this a little bit. 
So, well, let me show you over here. So this is one that's not built yet. All right, this is just a completely bare cylinder head, no valves, no springs, no retainers, nothing, no keepers, nothing. Um, completely clean cylinder head that I ported. You can see my, my work, not too shabby. Um, and we're gonna use some specialty tools that I have over here to put the valves, the keepers, and the springs in to get it to look like this. Once you get to this step right here, then you guys can go ahead and install your dowel pins into your block. Now here's a trick. It's a little time consuming, but you guys put all your studs in and then you preset them for height wise to make sure they're of the same even plane um, to make sure you don't have anything crazy for your taps and you tap these out with a thread chaser. Um, you can use a tap, but just make sure that you're cleaning off your, your shavings if there happens to be any. Um, do not, when you get ready to install the cylinder head, don't have these head studs in because it's gonna be super hard to line them up and you're just gonna mar the bottom of your finish of the flat side of your cylinder head. So make sure that these are out. Go ahead, align them with the dowel pins after you have your head gasket on. And then from the top of the cylinder head, go in and insert your actual head studs. Same thing for the other side. And then once I get to that point, guys, where we get the cylinder heads on, then I'll, I'll create a video and show you guys how to actually degree and time the, the engine. So we're just building the cylinder heads right here. And I'll create a short little video on how to put um, like an intake or an exhaust valve in. Not the whole entire head because it's just redundant. It's the same thing for each cylinder that you guys are doing. Come over here. I'm gonna use this tool right here to do it, but they sell these like little C-clamp air attachment tools that completely compress the spring for you with compressed air. The problem with that is, is sometimes the valve isn't always lined up perfectly and the spring can actually damage the three grooves where your, where your valve keepers go. So I like using this one. It's a little bit more time consuming, but it's worth it because it's safer in my opinion. And it's not too bad. Like once you get, you can do four four valves at a time with this thing. So it's not like it's crazy um, an additional amount of time. But if you want to be on the safer side, then that's the tool to go. I'll show you guys a short little clip on how to put one in here. But for the time being, that's what we got to tackle next. So once I get to that point, guys, I'll create another video.